the first time I talked about fluids, I think uh, in a high school, they thought it was just a liquid. A fluid could either be a liquid or a gas. A fluid is something that can flow. That's where the word fluid comes from, anything that can flow. Of course, it doesn't have a shape or size of its own, both liquids and gases. Take the shape of the container, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the reason is the molecular forces in a liquid or a gas is very small compared to the molecular forces in a solid. That's why a solid has a shape of its own, because the intermolecular force is so great that they have a shape, but a fluid does not. So this chapter is about fluids, but it's divided into two sections. In the first part, that will be before your exam, we'll only talk about fluids not moving, fluids at rest. In the second part, we will talk about fluid dynamics. So that's how it is. So I've just divided into two, so you only have a little bit to study with exam three, okay? And this chapter is tremendously interesting, like any other chapter in physics. This is the part where we think about why airplanes can fly, why a spinning ball curves. So many questions will be answered. But the fundamental definition of density is what we start with. Please do not read the textbook and listen to me completely. What is density? In chemistry, you have studied about density, density, density. Density is the mass over volume, which means, you know, if you just study the equation, that doesn't make sense. It's the mass of one meter cube. Do you know how big one meter cube is? One meter cube, that's big. So if you have one meter cube of water, that's going to have a big mass. It's actually 1,000 kilograms. So that's the density of water. And that's the standard. 1,000 kilogram per meter cube is the density of water, and that is the standard. I know in chemistry you would have taken it as one gram per centimeter cube, which is correct. One gram per centimeter cube. So that's density. Rho is the symbol for density, is mass by volume, and the unit is kilogram per meter cube. The density of water is one gram per centimeter cube or 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. That's clear enough, right? Now the next definition is relative density or specific gravity. Now, there are two words. I've not written the second word down. It's either called relative density. That means you are taking the density of any substance and comparing it with the density of water. That's all. So if we take a substance like steel, steel has a density of 8,700 kilogram per meter cube. What's the relative density of steel? I heard it. What's the relative density of steel? 8.7, that's all. It doesn't have a unit. Because the relative density of any substance is its density divided by the density of water. That's it. So 8,700 divided by 1,000 will give you the density of steel. Now, that's also called specific gravity. In case you see that word in a problem, remember it is the same. Specific gravity. Okay, I, I just meant density of X. Means anything. Divided by density of water. Pressure. I asked you about pressure. Forget about the T there. <laughs> pressure. Uh, I don't know. Maybe just imagine that you are stepped on and you're not wearing shoes and a lady that's wearing stiletto type shoes steps on you. That's going to hurt. Not because the lady is fat. She's thin, but her entire weight is acting on a small area. So pressure is, of course, connected to force and connected to area. 
or take the case of a thumbtack. A thumbtack, you try to push it into a piece of soft wood. The part that you're, you know, wait, let me just, what about the force that you apply on the head of the thumbtack and the force on the tip? Are they the same or different? Same force. Same force. Same force. It's a solid. It transmits the same force. But yet the pressure at both ends are not the same. The pressure on your thumb is definitely much smaller than the pressure at the tip. The reason is the tip has a real small area. That's it. So the definition of pressure is force divided by area. Pressure is force divided by area, and force is measured in newtons. Area is measured in meter squared, so the unit is going to be newton per meter squared. It's also called Pascal. Yeah, and just wanted to write down, say, smaller area means greater pressure. Smaller area, greater <coughs> pressure. Examples, tip of a nail, and a knife edge. You can cut a piece of cake using a knife. Don't try to cut it with your hands. Won't work. So when you say something is sharp, you know what it means now. The area is small, so you apply a force, the pressure is great, so it cuts through. That's what it means. Simple thing. You have any questions here? No? Oh. Pressure exerted by a fluid now. This is where it takes an interesting turn. Let's try to find the pressure exerted by fluid. What you see there is a container. Uh, has a fluid in it. Well, that part didn't come up. Okay, that's the fluid. And we're trying to find the pressure at the bottom of the container. Okay? Now, remember pressure is forced by area, isn't it? And in this case, the force would be the weight of the fluid. Correct? Isn't the entire weight of the fluid or liquid in this case acting at the bottom? So, couldn't you easily find the weight of the fluid? Couldn't you? If I give the height and I give you the area of cross-section, what's the volume? Be with me. What's the volume of fluid? I don't know what pi is, what r is. I, I've given you a and h. <laughs> Thank you. The volume is a times h. You're right. But generally, it's a times h. If it's a circle, then it's pi r squared. A is pi r squared, right? So let's be on the general note. A times h is the volume. What's the mass of fluid? If a times h is the volume of the fluid, what's the mass of the fluid? Look at the definition for density. Times the density, correct? Times the density, okay. Let me not go so much ahead. So the volume is A times H. The mass is A times H rho. <coughs> where rho is the density of the fluid. Okay, so what's the, the weight of the fluid? From mass, how do you get to weight? Aha! Uh -huh. From mass, how do you get to weight? If you know the mass of an object, what is its weight? Times 9.81, times G. Okay. A, H, rho, G. See, that's the weight acting at the base of the container. Isn't it? And that's nothing but the force. So I said, okay, that's the force. Therefore, pressure. According to the definition, pressure is force by area. Isn't it? And you get a very interesting result. What's interesting about that? <laughs> it does not depend on the area. The pressure exerted by, you know, just a few minutes back we were saying, smaller the area, bigger the pressure. Well, that is correct. But in the case of a fluid, the area of the container does not matter. Why? Because look at that formula. Pressure due to a fluid only depends on the height, which means the depth, you know what I mean, from the surface, density, and acceleration due to gravity. I just want to set up something and ask you this question, if I can stop it on time. Okay. Oh, stop.
Okay. It's easy. It's easy. If you were listening, it's easy. A and B. Two containers. Their shapes are not the same. You can see. The volume of fluid in both are not the same. But assume it's the same fluid. Okay? Same fluid. Where is the pressure greater? At A or B? Neither. <laughs> Somebody said neither. <laughs> Where is the pressure greater? A or B? Is the same. Because the height is the same, and I told you it's the same fluid, so they have the same density. You know, but sometimes students look at this. If I had not derived that formula, you would have certainly said the pressure here was greater. Now, does it depend on the shape of the container? No. So if I have a container which is like zigzag, you know, like a Z, if it still had the same height of the fluid, the pressure would still be the same. So keep that in mind. In this example, pressure is the same. Pressure exerted by a fluid does not depend on the shape, does not depend on the size of the container. It only depends on the height of the fluid and the density of the fluid. <coughs> now, the atmospheric pressure you know, some things are always there, but we never experience it in the sense that we don't realize it's there. But if the atmospheric pressure had suddenly vanished now, we would have all died, exploded. Exploded. Remember that, the reason why we do not feel the tremendous atmospheric pressure, because it's huge, is because our cells are also exerting an equal pressure outwards, kind of balancing the pressure. So that's why I said if the atmospheric pressure were to just vanish, <laughs> we'd all be gone. But we do not feel the atmospheric pressure. The man who gave the idea of atmospheric pressure first was an Italian scientist called Torricelli. He did an amazing experiment. I just want to tell you, because whenever you go out of the way, you look silly always. You're not with the crowd. This man set up a long tube right in the center of a street. A long tube about 11 meters long. That's quite long, right? What he did is he filled it with water. One end was closed, of course, and that tube filled it with water. Closed the other end with something. And then after inverting it into a trough of water, he just removed whatever was stopping the water from coming down, okay? Just removed it. Now, what do you expect to happen in this case? Is if you're not thinking, you expect all the water to come down, of course. Because the, the end is open, isn't it? The end is open. Now, this thing was set up, and what happened, what he saw was, of course, a little bit of water came down, but when he measured this height of water in the tube, let's say it came down to here, and then this height was measured, he saw that it's 10.33 meters of water. And all the people that passed by said, what's supporting that? Why isn't the water coming down? <coughs> of course, it's the atmospheric pressure. Because this container is open, isn't it? When it's open, the atmosphere is pressing down on the surface. And according to Pascal's principle, liquids transmit pressure equally in all directions. I told you Pascal's principle. We'll come back to that later. But did you hear me? Liquids transmit pressure equally. So if the atmospheric pressure is pressing down on the surface, surely the liquid transmits it, and now you know what is holding that water inside the tube from coming down is the atmospheric pressure. So how much is the atmospheric pressure? Easy. What's the height the atmosphere is able to support? 10.33. So what do you do with 10.33 times... 1,000 times 9.8. Did anybody understand? What's that? That's H rho G. Now, see, if that, the atmosphere is able to hold up that column of liquid, that means the atmospheric pressure is equal to the pressure exerted by that much, isn't it? If you do this, you will get approximately 101.325 pascals. That's 100,000 pascals. That's the atmospheric pressure. It's not a small number. 100,000 pascals. And we just walk about 
It's acting all the time on us. We don't even feel it. We don't even realize it. 100,000 pascals. That's why I'm saying if it vanishes, you're gone. Okay. But this looks strange. And what Torricelli did for the first time in history, tell me this. What do you have here? What do you have at the top of the tube? For the first time in history, he created a partial vacuum. There's no air there. In fact, it's called the Torricellian vacuum. He is the first scientist to create, create a vacuum. It was like this. Of course, there might have been a little bit of air molecules that diffused through the water. That's why I said partial vacuum. You see that? But then he did the entire experiment using mercury. Because this was too big. Mercury has a density of 13,600 kilogram per meter cube. Now, since it's 13.6 times bigger than the density of water, that would mean that the height that can be supported is going to be, help me out, 13.6 times less than this, isn't it? Somebody divide 10.33 by 13.6, let's see what you get. Because when you move, that's when you wake up. 10.33 divided by 13.6, you're going to get an approximate number. Did you get exactly 0.76? Okay, so approximately 0.76 meters of mercury, which is 76 centimeters of mercury. 76 centimeters of mercury. That's why in chemistry you have used this many times, haven't you? That the atmospheric pressure is equal to the pressure exerted by 76 centimeters of mercury or 760 millimeters of mercury. In chemistry, you don't use pascals. You use ATM. I don't know what it is. One atmosphere. No, no, no. Never in physics. It's easy to escape by saying, one ATM. Oh, how much is it? Now we know. It's one zero one three two five. Because this is a quantitative science. You see that? One zero one three two five. You need to know this number. Now I have told you about atmospheric pressure. That's the tube uh, that he filled with mercury this time and inverted it into a trough containing mercury and he saw that the height of mercury that stayed there without flowing down was 76 centimeters of mercury because the atmosphere was pushing down on the surface and therefore to calculate the atmospheric pressure just like I told you height of mercury 0.76 Density of mercury is 13,600 times 9.8, and you get 101.325 Newton per meter squared. That is the atmospheric pressure. And uh, I wish I had more time. I could have given you more examples. But let me tell you that Michel is not actually sucking juice using the straw. <laughs> The atmosphere is pushing it into her mouth. All she is doing is, you see, in the beginning when you put the straw to your mouth, it's not going to come into your mouth because there's air inside. So there's atmospheric pressure inside and outside balanced. Are you getting what I'm saying? So all you got to do is suck out that air. That's all you're doing because the atmosphere is already pushing, isn't it? So what you do is just remove that air and the atmosphere pushes it into your mouth. Now the next question is, like somebody asked me, then why do you have to keep on doing that? Because you can't make it airtight. If you could make it airtight, you know, sealed in such a way that no more air would ever get into the straw, you would never have to suck again. You would just go. <laughs> but you can't drink like that, can you? So when you do that, you know, air seeps in, so you have to keep on sucking the air out. Well, anybody knows that if you want to take liquid from one container to the other, you can use a hose. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? All you got to do is, in the beginning, remove the air in the hose. Is anybody with me? Mm -hmm. And as long as the height in the other container from which it's flowing down is greater, it's going to keep coming down. That's <laughs> atmospheric pressure at work. Even better, maybe a high school example. Maybe you've never heard about this. If you... Fill a glass with water, let's say a glass completely with water, no air, right up to the tip. Close it with a piece of cardboard and slowly invert this over a sink 
it's going to stay there. Won't come out. Easy, because the atmosphere is holding it up. How big could that glass be? How, could it, how big could it have been? Technically, 10.33 meters. Well, it's not going to work practically, but you know what I'm trying to say. Hello? Are you getting what I'm saying? And so it's quite easy for you to understand that, you know, just how much is that? 10 centimeters or what? That's how big a glass is. We'll stay there. The reason why it's going to fall off is because air somehow sneaks into the glass. Are you getting it? But there are so many examples coming into my head. I'll stop with one more, I promise. Otherwise, we will not roll into this chapter. <laughs> if you have ever tried to top up uh, engine oil in your car and try to pour it from that tin, the sealed tin, making a hole at the bottom, you struggled. You struggled. You'll have to like, shake it, and then you will get little pieces of fluid flying. But if you make a tiny, tiny hole on the top, just a tiny hole on the top. Now be careful. As soon as you make the hole, all the fluid is going to come down. Now you know why. Because when you only had that hole at the bottom, you were fighting the atmospheric pressure. Because the pressure of the motor oil inside was nothing compared to the atmospheric pressure. Are you getting it? And so, but when you make a hole on top, atmospheric pressure got cancelled because it's now acting both from top and from bottom. So now you have the extra pressure of the liquid comes out. I'll break my promise. One more example. <laughs> I saw this like millions of years back. No, I'm not that old. Anyway, uh, it was on television so many years back. There was a stick kept on the table, half of the stick on the table, half outside. A dry stick, okay? A twig or something like that. And somebody had spread out a newspaper on this side. Nicely spread it out so as to try to remove all the air from underneath it. And he asked the participants, what will happen if I hit on this side of the stick, on the edge that's outside the table? Obviously, the answer that the young people gave, the grade six or grade seven students, they said, the paper will fly away. Now, what's your answer? What is your answer? After I told you so much about atmospheric pressure, can't you... Consider the fact that the atmosphere is pressing down on the paper. And even if it was one meter squared, just or maybe half. Let's say the area of the paper was half a meter squared. Do you know that the force acting would be half of 101325? Hello? That's a big load. That's like keeping a heavy object on this side of the stick and hammering it here. Well, if I'd asked you, what would happen if I keep a stone on top of this part and hit here, you would have said it would be broken into two, right? Same thing is going to happen, believe me. As soon as you smack it, it's going to break into two pieces. Why? Because the atmosphere is pressing down. Now with this, I hope you understood what atmosphere, atmospheric pressure is, did you? But yet again, there is a problem. You measure the pr tire pressure. Well, I know you measure it in PSI, which is pascals, come on, what is it? Uh, pascals per square inch. You see, the units are kind of the same. Newton per meter squared. Are you getting it? Newton per meter squared. Pascals per square inch. And obviously the actual pressure is like 30 PSI, 32 PSI changes. <clears throat> How are you getting that 32 PSI? Aren't you using a gauge to measure that? Therefore that's called the gauge pressure. That's not the actual pressure. That's the gauge pressure. Because you're getting it using a gauge. Because if you want to get the actual pressure, you will have to add the atmospheric pressure to that. I'm not going to take more time on that thing. Because what you have inside is over and above the atmospheric pressure, right? If you have no air in a tire, you still have air in the tire. <laughs> did you understand? <laughs> what, do I, what did I mean? I mean, the atmospheric pressure is already inside, isn't it? Okay, so now you're adding on to the atmospheric pressure. So, to get the absolute pressure, PA is the absolute pressure. So when I say absolute pressure, that means total pressure. To get the absolute pressure, you've got to add the atmospheric pressure to the gauge pressure. So once again, to get the absolute pressure, absolute means 
total pressure. You have to add the atmospheric pressure to the gauge pressure. All right, All right. let's uh, work out a question. Which is the deepest ocean? Pacific, Pacific Ocean, and what's that part called? Mariner's Mariner Trench. Uh, it's about 11,000 meters deep only. <laughs> 11 kilometers deep. Go ahead and find the pressure at the bottom of the ocean. Find the pressure at the bottom of the ocean, 11,000 meters deep. I've given you the height, haven't I? Haven't I? Stop. Stop. Do you know the density? How much? It's not fresh water. This is a physics class. I shouldn't have stopped you. You were going to use 1,000. It's going to be more than 1,000. It's 1,025. <laughs> so it's 11,000 times 1,025 times 9.8. Go on. See, I asked you to find the pressure exerted by the water. Only the water, correct? I just want to see, show you the difference. That's why I did this. You got a big number, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Now, that is the gauge pressure. Everybody understood? That's the gauge pressure. Now, go ahead and calculate the total pressure. What do you have to do? Add the atmospheric pressure, which is 101325, to that number, and you get it. So, now look at that amazing number and please tell me because I don't remember what's the, uh, first give me the hydrostatic pressure just because of the liquid. How much was that? It's 1 times, or 1.1 1 .1 times 10 to the 8. 1.1 1 .1 times 10 to the? Eight. It's not 8. 8. eight. eight. Is it 8? Okay. 1.1 1 .1 <laughs> times 10 to the 8 pascals and then you added the atmospheric pressure and you got? Same no, give me that other digit also. 0 0.105. So you got 1.105? And the second one's 0 0.106. Okay, that's a big difference, remember that. When you have 10 to the power 8. Coming after that, that's a big... If it's not, what I'll do is, I'll give you that much money and you give me... I'll become rich immediately. Okay, anyway. So it was 1.105 times 10 to the 8. And the second case it is? Six. Do you know that there's a huge difference between those two numbers? It's followed by 10 to the power 8. But just look at this. That's 100 million pascals. Just imagine you going there to the, de uh, the deepest part of the ocean without any protective covering. You're gone. If you come up immediately, your blood will start oozing out of your sweat pores. Did you know that? Because of the sudden change in pressure. Because everybody knows that a man running out of his house naked is an interesting scene. <laughs> That's exactly what Archimedes did. That's exactly what he did. But he was not a fool and he was not trying to streak or something like that. This is what happened. But, you know, I'm wishing we were all put in that situation. I'm not saying you would all do that, but in that situation. This is the situation. Archimedes is a very popular, can I call him a scientist of his time? And uh, everybody knows him in Greece, even the king. He has little inventions, little discoveries. He's a mathematician. He, he knows everything. And one day the king has a crown made for him. And the king says, well, this crown is not made of pure gold. He doubts the goldsmith. So the king says, what do I do? He calls Archimedes and says, hey, come here. I know you're smart, you're intelligent. Find out what this is made of, but you cannot melt it. You cannot destroy the crown. I want it back as it is. And you have so many days. I don't know, let's say 10 days to live. It's a king. It's not democracy there. It's a dictator. So, which means in 10 days, if he doesn't give the king an answer, he's going to be dead. Now think about it. If that was how the exam three was going to be treated by you, <laughs> your grades would be much more than what you're going to get. I mean, that is a fact. And I'm trying to tell you, treat it that way, as a life or death situation. Anyway, let's come back. So when that happens, what happens? You only have 10 days to live. 
You're not going to think about anything else except that problem. Yes or no? Yes. So he started thinking about it in his sleep, if he could ever sleep. And even when he went into his bathtub. <clears throat> he had the, you know, Greeks are famous for their stone bathtubs, you know that. So he filled it with water and he goes down into it naked. And the water overflows. And he's been thinking about it. And he gets the idea. He shouts, Eureka, Eureka. And runs out into the street. Forgetting how he was. Somebody had to slap him and send him back something. So that's the meaning of the word Eureka. I have found it. I have found it. Archimedes principle. Welcome. Let's find out what Archimedes principle is. Okay. But before that, let me. I just forgot to tell you what Pascal's principle is. I did tell you. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? That I'll sidetrack if I don't have this? <laughs> yeah. I would have just missed that topic. Pascal's principle? Principle, I told you. A liquid transmits pressure equally in all directions. That is Pascal's principle. Pressure equally transmitted in all directions. Yeah, this is something that we've all seen. It's called a hydraulic jack. Haven't we all seen it? And let's see how it works in two minutes. It's amazing how you're able to lift a heavy load just by applying a small force, isn't it? In a hydraulic jack. Simple, Pascal's principle. Here we go. Okay, on this side you have a smaller cylinder. The area is A. I mean the area of cross-section, okay? So that's a piston there. And on this side, you have a bigger area, caps A. Be with me. If I apply a certain pressure here, according to Pascal's principle, will the pressure acting throughout be the same? Mm -hmm. So you mean to say, whatever pressure I apply here will be the pressure here? What's Pascal's principle? A liquid transmits equal pressure in all directions. I'm talking about pressure. You want to challenge Pascal's principle? <laughs> okay. So whatever pressure I apply here, I know when I say pressure, you, in your mind you have force. That's your problem, not mine. Are you with me? The pressure transmitted is the same. Okay. Now, if the force applied here is small f, what's the pressure applied here? Pressure. f by a, f by a, correct? Right. And if we, what we get here is caps f, what's the pressure on this side? Yes. Caps f by a. Can I put them both equal to each other? Yes. yes. Do it and make caps f the subject and get surprised. Go. Because the pressures are equal. All right, that's the force on the other side. This is the force on the bigger one. We are saying the pressures are equal. Didn't we say that? Okay. And make caps F the subject. And that's what you get. And one look at it, and you say, wow, isn't this a number greater than one? So if this number, if this ratio is 100, we have just magnified the applied force 100 times. Isn't it? Okay. Wow. So you apply one Newton on one side and you get 100 Newton on the other side. That's how the brake systems work too. You'll have to read that from the textbook, okay? You have a master cylinder. Of course, there's a brake fluid. Everybody knows that. Please, make sure it's topped up. Because any other part of the car is okay if it's not working. The brake system, if it's not working, that'll be the last time we'll drive it. See? So they've taken extra care to make sure that that system is very good. Okay. Let me not sidetrack. Did you understand this? Did you get it? No? But, you know... Kind of it doesn't make sense. How can we gain on something without losing on something? It's not true in life. So if we did gain in force a hundred times, we lost in something. What did we lose in? 
Somebody give me the answer. You know what I'm trying to ask you, right? We, we made the force a hundred times. We should have lost something according to the principle of conservation of energy. The work should be the same. And what's work? Work is force times distance. So if you had moved the smaller piston 100 centimeters, the bigger one will only move one centimeter. But that's okay. At least we managed to move it. If you didn't have this idea, you would never lift it. So isn't this better than that? Even a child can lift a part of a car. Come on. So we lose in distance. So that is the idea. So getting the idea of Archimedes' principle is very important. Okay. You have a container. And it has a fluid in it up to that height. And inside that fluid... I have a solid object kept right there, okay? Don't ask me how it stays there. Just imagine it's there. You see that solid there? It's a kind of cube. If you can visualize a cube. The top face of that solid is at a depth of H1 from the surface of the liquid. But the bottom face is at a depth of H2. And we will call the top phase A and the bottom P. That's the fluid. I just filled it. Everybody understands that the pressure at the top and the bottom are not the same. Where is the pressure greater? At the bottom. What's the pressure at the bottom? It's H2 times rho G, isn't it? What's the pressure at the top? H1 times rho G. Come on. Simple thing. Now, remember, a liquid cannot pull. It can only push. So at the bottom, the, the force is acting upwards, definitely. And on the top, it's acting downwards. So now we know that the net force is in what direction? Upwards. And we're going to find the net force. That's simple math. The pressure at A, H1 rho G. Therefore, the force at A. Yeah, to get the force, you just have to multiply with the area of cross-section, isn't it? So that little A that you see there is what? The area of that face. Remember, I told you it's a cube, isn't it? So it has a square face, so it's A is the area of that face. Now, if that's the force at A, obviously acting downwards, what's the force at B? What's the force at B? A times H2 rho G. Go ahead, find the net force. And obviously the net force is upwards because force at B is greater. And that net force, again, in the up direction is the difference. You can take out what's common. A rho G is common, and I get this. What's H2 minus H1? It is the height of that object. Okay, this is where you have to jump in and help me. Come on. Isn't that the height of the object? <laughs> so, isn't A the area of the base of the object? What do you get when you multiply the area with the height? Volume of what? Of the object. The volume of the object. Volume of the solid, right? Volume of the solid. Hold on, hold on. Be very careful. Is the volume of the solid in this case equal to the volume of the fluid displaced? Yes. You know what I mean by fluid displaced? Before I put the solid in, it was up to a certain height. And when you put it in, certain volume. Is it the same? Yes, in this particular case, because it's completely immersed. Right? But not in every case. Keep that in your mind. So in this case, I can say that A times H2 minus H1 is both the volume of the solid as well as the volume of the fluid displaced. Are you with me? If that's the case, then when you multiply it with the density of the fluid, come on, isn't rho the density of the fluid? You get the mass of fluid displaced. 
And if you multiply it with G, you get the weight of fluid displaced. We got it. So the net force that's acting upwards is equal to what? The weight of fluid displaced. And it's called the buoyant force. Have you ever heard it before? Buoyancy, buoyant force. Okay, let's complete that. That's where it is important. A-H-O-G, I said H is H2 minus H1, where H is the height of the solid. Okay? So the net force up is the weight of fluid displaced. Just write that one. That is important. Weight of fluid displaced. I did not write down the word buoyant force, but you may. Just write it down. It's called the buoyant force. Let's do another problem. We already did one problem. Let's do another problem, and you should only take two minutes. But let me just tie this up before you do the problem. If an Look, if an object floats, I'm asking you a question now. If an object floats, does it mean that the object is completely immersed? No. It could be a small fraction of it is immersed, another, you know, the remaining portion is outside. Can you visualize that? Just imagine a piece of wood floating in water. Will the whole wood be underwater? No. So now, stop and think. How did the wood know when to stop going down? Well, because it has a computer chip inside. <laughs> Come on. See, when you first put a solid inside a liquid, it'll keep going down until the weight of fluid that it displaces balances its own weight. I said it. So if you take a steel cube and put it in the water, it'll keep going down. Why? Because it's not able to balance its own weight. So if you take that steel and instead of making it a cube, make it hollow like a ship, then you know, although it's made of steel, and steel has a density of 8,700, which is 8.7 times more than water, roughly, right? But still it'll be able to balance its weight. Why? Because of that shape. Because there's a lot of air inside. Or in other words, if you take the average density of steel and air, it's going to be less than the density of seawater. Come on, I said it in all ways possible. So what is the law of flotation? It has to displace more water than it weighs. What? It has to displace more uh -uh. water. Uh -uh. It has to displace equal. That's the boundary condition. Law of flotation. And I'm saying flotation, not flirtation. Okay. Uh, the weight of the floating object is equal to the weight of fluid displaced. Weight of the floating object is equal to the weight of fluid displaced. That is the law of flotation. So slow now. Okay, now you, you have your problem. Uh, just take it down. Well, that's a diagram showing the buoyant force. FB is the buoyant force. Okay, the buoyant force should be equal to mg. That's it. If you want it as a formula, weight is mg is equal to the buoyant force. That's it. Okay, this is your problem. Uh, a piece of wood floats with 3 by 7 of its volume underwater. Three by seventh of its volume underwater. Fresh water. Find the density of wood. Three by seven. That's all you need. Find the density of wood. Don't say it if you get it. Just write it. <coughs> A piece of wood floats with three by seven of its volume underwater. You heard me clearly, didn't you? That's all you need. And I said fresh water, which means you know the density is 1,000. I gave you a clue now. What's the density of wood? I was not recording this. Anyway, so the answer is what? 3,000 by 7. Now we know why the Titanic had to sink. 
Well, not the entire reason, and we won't go into the entire reasoning. Remember that it, it did hit an iceberg, didn't it? Uh, the density of ice is close to 900 kilogram per meter cube, to be exact. That iceberg, 917 kilogram per meter cube. Are you listening to me? And it's floating in ocean water of density 1,025. Really close, which means major part of the ice would be underwater. If you calculate, 89% to 90% of the iceberg would be under. Only 10 would be out, and it was a foggy, misty morning. If you do, did read accounts of that, he could not see it, and rammed into the iceberg at top speed. Ice is like stone. If you don't believe me, I'll throw a piece at you. It ripped through the steel. That was the end of it. Now, the point here was not focusing on Titanic, it's visualizing the iceberg floating. It had to displace its own weight. For that, because its density was close to that of water, it had to go, a major part of it had to go down, correct? Thank you. Let's work out problems.